Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our conference on COVID-19 and the drive for safety and equality, uh, learning from the front line. We have a virtual uh, conference this year um, to celebrate World Patient Safety Day, uh, and we are being hosted by the NIHR Imperial Patient Safety Translational Research Centre in London and the Institute of Global Health Innovation. We're joined by many uh, from across the world uh, and specifically uh, from those across the NHS. We have a star-studded uh, field of, of uh, participants uh, and speakers today. So I want to start, uh, first of all, by thanking you for your attendance, uh, but also thanking our first speaker, uh, Professor Laura Aradazi, uh, who has pre-recorded uh, a session for us. Uh, as you know, Ara is the director of the NIHR Imperial Research Centre, Translational Research Centre, and is co-director of the Institute for Global Health Innovation. So I'd like to hand over now to Ara. Thank you very much, Ara. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning and welcome to the second annual World Patient Safety Day. It's a pleasure to have so many of you with us for this virtual celebration. Since we met last year for the inaugural World Patient Safety Day, as a global community, we have experienced a truly sobering and transformative 12 months. The COVID-19 pandemic has impacted every corner of healthcare delivery and how we work together as a healthcare community. We have suffered the extraordinary loss of nearly 900,000 citizens across the globe. As I speak to you today, cases continue to climb and now exceeding 28 million. Since the outset of the pandemic, we have also been confronted with a stark manifestation of health and social inequalities. In the UK, the COVID mortality rates for black men has been estimated as over 30% higher than the rate for white men. COVID-19 continues to exacerbate the injustices we have long recognized. People in the most deprived neighborhoods are more than twice as likely to be killed by the virus than those in the wealthiest areas. This pattern has mirrored in our healthcare workforce. In the UK, where just over 20% of all healthcare staff are black and ethnic minorities. 63% of those who died from COVID-19 were banned. These figures are even more chilling when we look at the medical staff in this country. 44% of our doctors are banned and 95% of those who died were banned. In the face of these statistics, I commend my colleagues at the WHO for selecting the theme for today, healthcare worker safety for patient safety. When our health and care systems are under pressure, it is our workers who are called upon to carry the burden. When whole nations lock down, the responsibilities of our healthcare workers take on even greater significance. At the onset of the lockdown in the UK, when the number of cases coming into hospital was dramatically increasing, much of my elective surgery was being postponed. And so I decided to volunteer to work in the intensive care unit, which was both short of staff and under huge pressure. It was here on the front line, I witnessed the fear of many people working in health service certainly in my own institution. That fear was compounded with the issue about personal protective equipment and lack of it. Sometimes, or the availability of the testing for people who were working in the hospital. The experience confirmed to me the importance of today's message. Healthcare worker safety is patient safety only protecting the physical and mental health of our workforce can we guarantee the safety of those in their care. As we think about healthcare worker safety today, I encourage you to listen carefully to the views 
of our frontline staff and patients in the first video. Their insight are those of the true experts who know firsthand how to best we can support our healthcare workforce. It is my intention that their reflections expressed today will form the foundation for our actions and interventions in the future. As we move past the first peaks of COVID-19, we have the responsibility to capture learnings from our healthcare workers to understand what we have lost, what we have gained, and how we can move forward into a safer future for health services. I am confident that together in partnership with frontline staff, academics, scientists and citizens, we can build a safer environment for our healthcare workers. COVID-19 has demonstrated time and again that we can achieve groundbreaking feats of science if we work together. Already by harnessing behavioural insight and technology, our team are working on rapidly designing, trailing and rolling out new approaches to testing, innovative digital solutions for monitoring patients outside hospital and refined ways of working that support safer distancing and infection control. Together, we are moving into a new normal. In this new normal, healthcare safety will be paramount, both for healthcare workers and patients. We are moving toward an era of health security where we need to anticipate and preempt threats to our healthcare system. Rather than response when safety goes wrong, we need to be proactive in building the infrastructure for safe care and future proof services so that by default things go right. This new paradigm for healthcare delivery requires us to address the enduring challenges for patient safety as well as the emerging threats. We must do better in terms of tackling inequalities. We must invest in safer technology and cyber security to protect our ever-growing digital health platforms against attack. And most fundamentally, we need to do this in partnership with healthcare workers and patients. Patient safety is healthcare worker safety. My team at the NIHR Imperial Patient Safety and Translational Research Center, along with other colleagues at the other two PSTRCs, have kicked off this effort to generate academic evidence that identifies and preempts threats to our patient safety. For example, in advance of today's activities, in partnership with the WHO Global Patient Safety Collaborative, we have written a policy brief about the crucial links between healthcare worker safety and patient safety. Looking to the future, we are also starting a new endeavor in partnership with Jeremy Hunt's charity, Patient Safety Watch, to expand the public evidence base about the UK's most important patient safety metrics, thereby providing a platform for action and a dial to monitor progress. We have partnered with the Behavioral Insight Team to conduct a second national trial to reduce clinical burnout, this time focusing specifically on nurses. We are also partnering with our frontline colleagues to capture and distill learnings from COVID-19, developing new clinical pathways of COVID care and continuing to monitor prevalence in the community, our hospitals and our care homes. Now is a time to learn from our successes, and that is why we look at our esteemed leaders. Today, we are joined by some of the most preeminent figures in patient safety globally. Following this introduction, you will hear from the Right Honourable Jeremy Hunt, who has championed the cause of patient safety throughout his time in government, and now is the CEO 
of Patient Safety Watch. Furthermore, you will hear from our live panel, including Mike Durkin, Suzanne Masters, David Navarro, Julian Redhead, Raymond Anakui, and Dominic Allwood and Kelsey Flott. This session will allow us to dive into conversations with a range of experts to explore learning from COVID, from local organizations, national bodies, international responders, and the QI and research community. Our vision is that this diversity of expertise will facilitate dynamic ideas for future patient safety innovation. And I encourage you to join in with the discussion and contribute your ideas on the live group chat. To conclude our program, we are very grateful to Minister Nadine Doris, Member of Parliament, for contributing a compelling statement about safety and the future efforts to promote and progress the safety agenda in this country. Finally, you will hear from Dr. Aidan Fowler, author of the National Patient Safety Strategy, who will explain how, in light of the pandemic, we have been able to make advancements to safety over the past 12 months. He will also set us a challenge for what priorities will be key as we move forward towards the next World Patient Safety Day. Thank you again for joining us today. Thank you to our speakers and our team of the NIHR Imperial PSDRC for orchestrating this event. Most importantly, thank you to our NHS staff who have demonstrated such selflessness and courage in their service of our health service throughout one of the most demanding periods in history. Thank you. Ara, thank you very much for uh, a great launch for wow. today's conference uh, and outlining uh, the other speakers who are going to be joining us uh, during the day. Now, as Ara mentioned to earlier, uh, our next video really is a session bringing the front line into our rooms. We really know that imposed solutions don't work unless they are developed and supported and work at the front line. So I'd like you all to now listen uh, to the healthcare worker staff from across the Imperial Trust who contributed to our next video session. Thank you. issues at the start were around um, staff welfare and staff engagement because actually getting those two things right other things branch off from those um, you know well if welfare and engagement are set, and safety I mean safety comes into welfare of course but if those two are seen as uh, central um, other things branch off of those I think it was very apparent to us early on um, that uh, burnout was a high risk factor. Um, there were issues, as we know, and concerns um, for BAME staff around PPE. Um, it almost seems like it was a continuous list um, of different things, but what we were doing was focusing on the issues that were coming to the attention of, of, the, of the union reps and officers and bringing those to the partnership table. We need to focus not just on the health and safety of patients, we have to consider ourselves as well as healthcare workers. We need to look at our health and safety, at our needs, our physical needs. Sometimes as nurses, we forget that we also are human beings and we have needs and we always focus our energy to make, making sure the patients get the best treatment they can. But this pandemic made me realize for myself as well, that I have my needs, that I have also have to focus on my inner feelings and emotions as well.
I think, I think um, as a result of the pandemic, I'm a lot more conscious of the risk that I guess other patients or the environment pose to me in a hospital. I don't think I'd ever would have thought before about, like, I guess I've thought about needle stick injuries or yeah, and getting blood borne diseases as a result, but I don't think I ever would have thought about like picking up a uh, respiratory disease whilst being in a hospital or yeah, I guess contracting something from the person in the bed of next to me. I, I just would have trusted that that wasn't possible. I just never have given it a second thought. Whereas now that's definitely something that I'm a lot, a lot more, more conscious of. So I guess, yeah, my key priority would just be to still <laughs> stay as unwell as I am when I come into hospital or into wherever I am, not get worse, but uh, also to not pick up something new. When you're sick testing all day, you don't have a chance to look at your emails. It's non-stop. So having a communication email at the end of the day was actually quite a, a nice thing. It meant that we could keep up to date, uh, catch up with what changes have been made um, and any, any information that was being disseminated. It meant that we were involved in it. So I think for me, the communication emails were a, a very important part. What I would say is um, that if changes are going to be made, changing on a Friday where it's difficult then to do something about that change over a weekend was probably a, 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 a point that's probably not so helpful. And I think the trust has definitely, we've definitely improved as an organisation. I think we've definitely, as a result of the pandemic, we are definitely um, listening more and the, and the flow of information is, is now, there is more information going up, as it were, um, as well as down. But I think that that needs to remain in place. I think we need to be able to give all levels of staff um, the permission and, and the, the ability also to, to feedback um and, and just just even even if it is just just letting people know what they're going through i think we need to have a listening ear for that as well listening is the first part collecting that information and data which i'm pleased to say is already being done in this organization at imperial and i'm in, involved and aware of how and where that's happening that does of course require Listening is fine, but that requires others to articulate, to speak and to voice their opinion. So it's got to be a two way thing, which is why I would, as a trade union rep, encourage people, all staff to participate. It's the same within an election. You need to get your voice heard. So when surveys are coming out, when people are putting out questionnaires, you know, people need to respond to those to get their voice heard. Yes, that's a choice to do so. But if people are not doing that, then how can their voice be heard? On one of the wards that I worked on, there was a, a ward hostess who was petrified of going anywhere near a COVID positive ward. Um, and just through talking to her, um, showing her some understanding for her fear, giving her a bit of confidence, a bit of positive reinforcement, providing information um, and a chance for her to voice her anxieties and have answers given to her. Um, made her much more confident and in fact she's so confident now in working with COVID positive patients she wants to uh, train as a nurse so for me that's a, a real bonus. One of the things that worried me myself because I'm from the BAME community and my hair texture is quite different from everybody else and um, I tend to treat and wash my hair in the weekend because I work Monday to Friday. So then um, I think I was just worried because um, obviously in the news you'd see people covered from head to top and then um, we had our own different PPE. So my main worry was um, obviously we didn't know how the virus was being transmitted and if it could get into your clothes or anything like that because at that time we were wearing scrubs. So um, obviously that had to do with my hair as well. 
because I thought that I had to cover my hair. So there was scenarios where by nurses were using plastic bags and stuff like that to cover their hair. And um, because everyone was really worried and trying all sorts of things. But I have someone that I know that uh, seems stressed. So we designed a little hat and she made a few for me. And when I brought them to work, everyone, everyone absolutely loved them. I got permission from my uh, manager if I could wear them. And I told her the reasons which she understood. And then um, we had a meeting for the nurses just to have a catch up about how they were feeling during the pandemic. And one of the main things that was raised people were worried about covering their hair. So people that didn't really have direct links with me hadn't had the opportunity to get their hats from the person that was supplying them to me. I think the first thing to say is that um, there was no guidance from PHE about head covering. Mm -hmm. um, so we didn't know whether it was something we should provide for our staff, something we, want, we wouldn't have to provide for the staff. Um, but we, we heard through Janice that Nonnie had raised this question. Um, yeah. And we wondered uh, how we could support um, BAME colleagues that did want uh, to cover their hair. Um, and so the, the, the little uh, hat that was made um, came to our group um, and Nani uh, was invited to the strategic PPE group to um, talk about her hat. Um, and then the question was, how could we, um, how could we source something um, that fits that criteria? Um, that was cost effective, that was uh, that was uh, suitable for as many um, of the community as possible. And then whether we we thought about whether it should become uh, part of the uniform policy or whether we should buy it as a one off item, uh, particularly because we were mindful that subsequent waves were, uh, you know, possible. So I didn't wait because today is Friday and I'm going to be able to wash my hair tonight. So it looks I, I made sure I got the one that matches my uniform color. So I think everyone else will have like a um, Marcel's uniform is maroon and they're going to provide that color as well. And then there's a light blue, different colors for all different um, job titles. So the, the end point is that we, we find one that matches uh, individual uniforms. So as Nani was saying, we would, you know, the, the colors of the uniform are specific to healthcare professionals. Um, and so we are hoping to be able to uh, provide them in a colour that matches the individual's uniform so that, you know, they don't feel that um, it's something um, uh, that, 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 you know, might identify them in some way um, unnecessarily or, or in a way that, that perhaps we wouldn't want. So we, that's our end point, to get it in the uniform policy and make it available to staff if they want to wear it. We're not saying you do or you don't, but if you would like to, it is available for you to use um, and in the colours that would match people's uniform. Uh, as a ward manager, my main worry would have been the staffing. Are we going to be able to look after the patients well, you know, still provide them the best care that Imperial provides and stuff like that. So providing the little bit, even if it's like something like a little head cover, it actually encourages people to feel appreciated. So personally, I felt really appreciated. It needs to be a, a cultural thing. It can't just be a reactive system. It can't just be, you know, a robust system of instant reporting. It actually has to start in people's um, a, a approach to patient safety the moment they come into work every day. And you can only instill that uh, through a through a general culture that people uh, that that means that people feel they belong to that culture and they feel they're able to uh, contribute um, whatever their role, whether they're a receptionist, um, PA, a phlebotomist, or a consultant. Whatever their role, they feel able to that they have a voice and they can contribute to improving on patient safety. Patients were extremely sick. Our colleagues were extremely sick. Um, we lost colleagues um, and all of that weighs heavy on your heart when you want to provide the best care that you can for your patients and you're trying to look after um, your colleagues too and be thinking about your family at home as well. Um, so if we can eliminate a concern that the staff have or at least mitigate that risk to its smallest degree, 
um, then they can focus on doing their work, looking after those patients, and the patients feel, um, or rather don't feel, the anxiety from the staff then, and that can only be a good thing for everybody. We were scared, like literally everyone was scared. I'm like normally a very calm person, I talk really slowly, I'm always laid back, but I was really scared. But then my first thought was, if I'm scared, what about the person that has actually got the COVID? So I would take time to actually go and sit with the patients and talk to them. So like the kindness prevailed. And I think that's kind of something that a nurse needs to have. Like as a healthcare worker, you need to have like that humanity in you to actually care for someone that is not in a similar position as yourself. That, that dynamic has changed, that, that trust, the way that we communicate and I think also how we see each other I think it's really easy to see like your staff and your nurses as what they do is their profession I think COVID and the whole crisis has kind of I think shifted that and made a lot more awareness about what people are going on are like struggling with outside of their work and I think the sacrifices that have been made by staff in NHS to care for patients. Thank you. Uh, thank you to the staff of across I I Imperial uh, for that that uh, that great video session, bringing together uh, for me the the combination of elements of learning, uh, of measurement, uh, of culture. Uh, and most of all, uh, important uh, of, of leadership. Uh, and thank you to Noni for her work uh, in developing uh, that, that concept of, of, of headwear. It now gives me enormous pleasure uh, to uh, be able to introduce our next speaker, the Right Honourable Jeremy Hunt. Um, uh, I've known Jeremy for, for a few years now. Uh, we first met uh, at the Excel Centre, actually. He probably can't remember this. When, when I introduced him to Don Berwick, uh, who came over to help um, set up uh, our, our work on transforming the safety across the NHS uh, for patients. Um, now at Nightingale Hospital, um, uh, soon to become a Nightingale Hospital, um, uh, and then to become the longer serving uh, Secretary of State for Health. But, but he did more than that. He's translated himself into a patient safety champion uh, with uh, global recognition for his work. Um, and I know this today is a, is a particularly busy day for him. Um, uh, as he also juggles his other role now as the chair of the Parliamentary Select Committee on, on Health and Social Care. So without further ado, can I introduce you to uh, the Right Honourable Jeremy Hunt. Jeremy, thank you for joining us uh, and sharing your thoughts uh, on today's World Patient Safety Day. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mike. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be with you. Um, I've just been at the, the virtual launch of World Patient Safety Day with Dr Tedros. And um, I must say it's a great UK achievement. Uh, we pushed hard to have uh, an annual World Patient Safety Day. It's happened and um, it is something now which is really starting to wake up the whole world to the issues around patient safety. Um, and uh, so it's a very exciting day. And uh, thank you, uh, Lord Darcy, for organising this morning. Arrow was one of the pioneers of patient safety in the UK. He was the first government minister to really understand those issues uh, which with his clinical background uh, was extremely important and I, it's great that we've got you Mike I think of you as uh, I was going to say one of the fathers of the patient safety movement in the UK but maybe even one of the grandfathers of the patient safety movement in the UK because I know you're a grandfather as well um, but uh, David Nabarro good to see you here um, you've been fantastic on patient safety at the WHO Ruth May our chief nurse I work very closely with and actually I do want to thank Nadine Doris for the interest that she has shown as a minister in patient safety um, which has been very consistent and very very important. When I was health secretary I had to respond to a series of scandals where poor quality care had sadly resulted in needless deaths and I learned how common avoidable harm and death is uh, not just in the UK but around the world. According to the WHO there are five preventable deaths every minute uh, making it a bigger killer than HIV, malaria and TB combined. 
And I learned something else, which is that no one wants to tackle issues around patient safety more than our frontline doctors and nurses. But because too often they're threatened with losing their job, their license to practice, their professional reputation, litigation, it's often impossible to speak out openly and transparently about things that have gone wrong about the ordinary human error that is part of their lives just as it's part of all of our lives and we have to make it easier for people to talk about patient safety issues in a no blame context so that we can avoid these tragedies being repeated and the thing that i think has distressed those same frontline workers most in this year of a horrific pandemic has been the worry that they may be passing on the virus to their very own patients. And given that 70% of virus carriers are asymptomatic, that is a real risk. Indeed, we've had some London hospitals where over 40% of staff were infected at the peak of the pandemic. And according to some of the evidence that's been submitted to SAGE, up to 11% of our deaths in the UK were of patients who actually caught the virus in hospital. If that figure was replicated worldwide, it would mean up to 45,000 patient deaths globally were caused by poor infection prevention and control, and up to 7,000 health worker deaths were caused for the same reason. So the reason that this year the theme of World Patient Safety Day is health worker protection is because patient safety and staff safety are two sides of the same coin. You can't have one without the other. And really what I wanted to say this morning is that catching COVID-19 in a healthcare setting really should be a never event, something that simply never happens because staff and patients have a right to be safe and expect to be safe when they go to hospital or any other healthcare setting. And today's charter launched by the World Health Organization and the five goals it's launched are designed to help make that happen. And those five patient safety goals are to reduce sharp injuries, uh, collect proper data on safety related deaths, reduce workplace stress and burnout, improve personal protection practices and adopt the zero tolerance of violence towards healthcare staff. These will all help improve the safety of staff and patients too. And one of the most distressing aspects of our failures across this front around the world is the disproportionate impact it has on BAME health workers, who we should remember in England are about 40% of doctors, 20% of nurses, uh, and nearly 20% of the social care workforce as well. But the combination of higher vulnerability to COVID in these groups and the fact that globally one in seven reported COVID cases are health workers means that for uh, people from a BAME background, they have a double whammy. So we really do need to do everything we can to support, encourage support for today's charter and help tackle this terrible injustice. Now, um, published alongside this charter one of those goals you will have heard is something that i think will be music to mike's ears ara's ears uh, david nabarro's ears which is to ask all countries to record and analyze every safety related death because one of the things that's plagued the patient safety movement is a lack of good data and we all know that what gets measured gets done so this too is a, a major step forward um, and the final thing I wanted to say is let's not forget in the second rather unusual World Patient Safety Day right in the middle of a pandemic that even before coronavirus we were having those five preventable deaths every minute. That works out as 2.6 million preventable deaths every year um, and you know patient safety or the lack of patient safety has been for many years a hidden killer. Um, after the pandemic, 
and all the stories we've been hearing, it is hidden no more. So let's use this moment of truth to tackle not just the short-term dangers from a terrible virus, but the long-term scandal of all preventable harm. And I am uh, wanting to mark this second World Patient Safety Day. By the way, that was the bell in the House of Commons you were hearing there, just in case anyone was wondering. Um, I'm going to do something personally to mark this second uh, World Patient Safety Day, which is I'm going to put together a, a weekly patient safety email in which I will try to bring together all the important patient safety news that's happening. Um, and uh, because the people in this virtual conference really are the UK's patient safety movement, you are the, the champions of patient safety, I hope you will all sign up because this email is going to be a way for us all to keep in touch with the latest news. And anyone who would like to subscribe to that email, uh, please just, uh, you can get it on the Patient Safety Watch website or you can email me at huntj at parliament.uk. Uh, so um, that's really all from me, but I hope you have a very successful day. Uh, thank you everyone for keeping the flame flying and for the fact that we are, as a global patient safety movement, really now going from strength to strength. Thanks very much indeed. Jeremy, thank you. Uh, thank you for those uh, those great words and, and thank you for the invitation uh, to, to join uh, join with you uh, in sharing information on a weekly basis uh, of safety and safety events across the UK. Um, uh, and it was good to also hear that uh, the division bell going, so I'm sure that, that means that there's activity uh, going on uh, across Parliament um, and um, uh, I'm sure we'll continue to do during the day. It now gives me uh, enormous pleasure to introduce the panel uh, who I think are probably going to be also thinking about well what questions are going to be asked now as a result of Jeremy Jeremy's uh, session now because we've now uh, would like all the participants uh, across um, uh, who are listening to the conference to post in their questions uh, to uh, that may be reflecting on what uh, Jeremy or Ara or the workers from Imperial said uh, but also those that they have themselves thought of uh, that they would like to put to our panel. Um, we have a distinguished panel with us, uh, but first of all, one of our uh, panelists, Dominique uh, Alwood, who's a, a leader uh, in uh, uh, improvement science uh, at Imperial, but also previously at the Health Foundation, was unable to join us this morning. So she's record recorded uh, her session and I'm going to take an indulgence from you and, and play that session first and then move into the panel. Uh, and introduce the panel after uh, Dominique's session. So uh, over now to listen to Dominique, thank you. Hello, my name is Dominique Allwood. I'm a consultant in public health medicine and I'm also associate medical director at Imperial College Healthcare NHS Trust. I'm really delighted to be here with you today to be talking about healthcare worker safety in the context of World Patient Safety Day. I've been asked to reflect on a few things where I think quality improvement might be able to help improve healthcare worker safety. And I'm just gonna speak briefly about a few of those things that I've observed during the COVID pandemic. The first one really is about gathering staff experience and using that to co-design and co-produce solutions. I noticed during COVID that we were often very busy and didn't always have time to ask staff what they thought and what they wanted. We didn't always take the opportunities to take that information and feed it in in a co-produced and co-design way. Going forwards, I think that's really important. We know that our staff had differing experiences during COVID and sadly it became very obvious that there were lots of inequalities that were exacerbated. We need to pay attention to those differences and understand the different needs of our staff in terms of their phys physical and psychological support and what might be putting them at risk and what might actually help reduce that risk. So co-production and co-design is really important and I think something organisations need to focus on much more going forwards with COVID. Linked to that is a second area which I think about which is about learning systems and learning organisations. 
What I mean by that is really taking data in real time, interpreting it and understanding what it means about how you make decisions, making the change happen and closing the loop. That's really the basic and fundamental tenets of a learning system. And getting that culture of learning and that curiosity to understand and combine data is really important. I had the privilege of being able to work at the Nightingale Hospital during the COVID pandemic. And whilst there were some criticisms about the fact that we didn't quite need the ventilated bed capacity that was brought about as a result of that, what we did learn was lots of ways in which we might set up data collection and combined data sources in a way that we haven't done so well in the NHS before. We took patient safety incident reporting, staff experience data and all sorts of information and gathered that together daily to give an understanding of what was going on in that organisation. One of the key ways that we got timely access to staff experience data, and let's remember they were staff working in a novel area treating a novel disease that so we needed to learn very quickly about their experience, was to develop this role of a bedside learning coordinator, gathering qualitative data and information through observation and direct interactions with staff. They were often clinically trained, and at the point in which they were gathering that data, they were supernumerary on those shifts. They gathered that data and brought it out back into the organisation, and we combined that with lots of other data sources to give an impression of what was going on. That pilot was really well received and is now being rolled out more widely across London. I think the third area that I wanted to concentrate on was really taking a systems view about the issues and problems. There were lots of things like PPE shortages that, that were putting people at real or perceived risk during the COVID pandemic. And it's understandable that people were reactive and focused on the problem in front of them. But if you think about improvement principles, improvement tells us that you need to understand the system in which you work in, because if you make a change over here, then you might influence something that you're not understanding in this place. Or if you're always just doing something very localised, you don't get the opportunity really to get the double loop learning, which is fixing the problem in more of a long term way. So understanding the system and being able to map it out in a more sophisticated way is really important. So just to recap, I think there's a few improvement principles we can think about going forwards during COVID. One is about really truly co-designing and co-producing solutions that help reduce healthcare worker risk and improve their experience. Another is about thinking about a learning system approach and different ways in which we gather data and plug those in and think about our culture of learning. And the third one is taking a systems thinking approach, really understanding the bigger picture in which these problems are occurring. Thank you for listening. That was great, Dominique, and thank you very much uh, for those words. Uh, I've certainly taken th from that uh, the whole concept, I think, as we move forward of, of, of systems thinking and systems learning. Uh, and one of our great challenges, of course, now is to translate that globally um, uh, so that all systems can learn at the same pace, um, uh, which I think is a, a really important goal for us to try and achieve um, so that we, we don't leave uh, systems and, and systems and therefore people behind. Uh, I'd like to take the opportunity to introduce the rest of our panel uh, who are, are live and are quaking in their various rooms uh, across the globe and across the UK and, and certainly across uh, Europe. So I'd like to first of all introduce Susan Masters, um, who is the Director of Nursing and Policy and Practice at the Royal College of Nursing. Uh, welcome, Susan. Um, yeah. I'd like to also now introduce Dr. David Nabarro. Uh, who is uh, well known to many of you for his Navarro narratives, but also uh, for his contributions on, on, on the media, particularly over the last few months. David uh, is a special envoy on COVID-19 for the World Health Organization, uh, and luckily for us is a co-director of the Institute for Global Health uh, Innovation. Uh, we're also privileged to have uh, Raymond Anakwe with us. Uh, Raymond is a consultant orthopedic surgeon uh, at Imperial College Healthcare Trust. Uh, and is really has been and will remain on the front line for us. Uh, we also have Dr. Kelsey Flott, and Dr. Kelsey Flott is the Policy Fellow and Patient Safety Lead um, uh, at the Patient Safety uh, Translational Research Centre. Um, um, 
But our first speaker, who I'm going to ask the first question to, is known to many of you as uh, Dr. Uh, Professor, rather, Julian Redhead, uh, who is uh, the medical director for uh, Imperial Trust, but also has a much wider brief across uh, systems in London uh, in many different uh, elements of, of his work. So uh, I'd like to thank you all for joining us. Um, and uh, if I may, I'll start the questions with Julian, really, um, as uh, the leader of a, of a large trust um, in the in the UK and in London, uh, and has borne uh, uh, the brunt of a lot of the early uh, elements of, of COVID in when we had our first wave back earlier in the spring. So, Julian, I wonder if you could explain to us um, really what you felt was the most effective uh, interventions your organisations put in place uh, to support healthcare worker safety during the pandemic. Um, I'd be particularly interested in your in your thoughts on on local testing. Um, both at the time, but also uh, currently. Thank you, Julian. No, thank you, Mike. And, and, and I'm really, really pleased to be here and um, uh, on the World Patient Safety Day and, and celebrating with all our colleagues across the globe uh, the important work that's being done in this area. And um, as you said, West London and, and Imperial was at the forefront of, of this. And I, I think some of the learning we've already heard in some of the excellent videos that you've shown, but maybe to sort of highlight some of those that we put in place. The first one I would say is collaboration. And um, this wasn't just around collaboration between colleagues within the hospital, but also between institutions. And it was truly a response that we needed to make to protect our, our patients and in particular our staff around uh, the work that we did um, across Northwest London between the institutions. And an example of that would be the PPE. And we heard about shortages around PPE. And I'm, I'm really glad to say that we never ran out of PPE, both within Imperial or across our system. Um, but that was due to really hard work of moving PPE, recognising where our bottlenecks were around it and making sure that we could uh, use the resources across all of us to keep our staff and ultimately our patients safe. So I think that collaboration would be one thing that I think is really important. And as part of that, we formed very early on in the pandemic something we called the Clinical Reference Group which allowed us to bring together senior leaders from uh, from both um, from medical background, nursing background and allied health, allied health professionals and indeed patients um, into a group that we could discuss on a daily basis uh, that the emerging learning that was coming out from COVID, uh, the changes that we need to make to protect our staff and patients and allow us to receive information up from our staff as well. And we could be very light of foot and uh, very uh, nimble in how we could uh, respond to the crisis through that. And one of the aspects that came out of there very early on was uh, a clinical dis decision support. This was where we had secret meetings available 24 hours a day to support front staff with the difficult decisions they had to make around management of patients and in particular sometimes around end of life decisions as well and how we could work with our patients around those decisions that were being made. Another thing that came out of that, that, that group was uh, the PPE, and it wasn't necessarily about shortage of PPE, but making sure that our staff were uh, educated in how to use the PPE properly, and also to support them with people on the ground who would go around and help them on a daily basis understand the needs of the PPE, make sure it was in the right places and was being used correctly. And that leads us on to training, which I think is another really important part to how we kept our patients safe and our staff safe, uh, was to making sure that all our, our staff were trained in the areas that they were going to work in. And sometimes these were in really difficult areas and places they were very unfamiliar with. So going, uh, we heard uh, Lord Darcy talk about working on ITU and the training that was needed for those staff who were going to be working in those unusual environments to them. The next part for me really uh, would be around communications and we heard that in the videos coming from the staff very uh, closely and making sure that we were communicating to our staff on a daily basis 
Uh, we heard about the difficulties around uh, some of the timings of that information, but this is a really rapidly changing environment. We were learning all the time and we're having communications from the central team that we need to interpret and put into practice to protect our staff and patients. And I think that was a really important part and a really hard part of the work was done around communications. Yeah. And then finally, for me, is, is, is debrief and learning and insight. And we heard some of that from Dominique earlier on about how we could bring staff together um, to really get them to help us to understand the changes that we need to make to make things safer for our patients and our staff. So all of those coming together leads me into the whole idea of staff well-being, which was something that we discussed on a daily basis, both through the CRG and through sort of gold control for Northwest London. And how is it that we could keep our colleagues safe um, and well during this pandemic? And I think one thing that we haven't spoken about here was the huge response from community and the really important part that collaboration played within that, how colleagues helped each other uh, in debriefs immediately after events and difficult situations, but also how uh, the community around us came around to support the NHS, both in, in emotions and the, the clap which occurred on a, on a Thursday, which I think was really, really important to keep up our staff morale, but also in terms of hotels, food, practical solutions to help our staff feel safe, cared for and well at work. I think those things that I would highlight and I'm happy to answer questions. You did ask specifically about testing um, and I think testing is really important. It's important to give confidence to our patients and our staff and also to make sure that we understand where we need to target our resources around communications and better uh, uh, following of government advice around social isolation, but also around better use of uh, of hand hygiene and those simple messages that will help protect us all during this pandemic. And we know that we're going into a, a situation where uh, we've got differences around the country in background infection rates. And we've also got huge risks sitting or uh, potential risks sitting within our elective programme and getting those balances right to make sure that we can get through those different programmes is really important and testing is part of that. And so we will continue to support all our staff um, in testing uh, and targeting the testing as best as we can. Great, Jenny. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Great, Thank you. great kickoff uh, answer. And and uh, if I could just take this opportunity just to remind everybody uh, who are listening to to post their questions for the panel as as they as they uh, emerge. Um, I think you're absolutely right. Um, uh, in terms of the issue about collaboration and one of the things that we've I think we've learned across uh, the globe in, in the last six months is the absolute necessity for collaboration, uh, collaboration at, at, at scale, but collaboration with with measurement uh, and sharing transparently data uh, at scale. Um, I, I'd like now to uh, also remind the panel that we, we are going to have a conversation. So if you believe that there's something you want to say in response to something one of the other panelists have said, please don't worry about um, uh, interrupting or coming in. Uh, I think we're all we can all cope with that. Um, Raymond, you're you're on the front line as a, a as an orthopedic surgeon, um, uh, and so you see the the, the, the front line challenges um, really from. Uh, the sharp end uh, since the beginning of, of, of uh, the spring earlier this year. I wonder if you could reflect on what you thought were the biggest challenges for yourself, but but also I'd be really interested in what you have you observed amongst your team, particularly uh, the uh, the nurses, the therapists, the junior doctors that worked with you. Thank you, Raymond. Raymond, you might need to uh, unmute, sorry. Try again, Raymond. Try. Thank you. No, still muted. Uh, we'll try and unmute to our end if you otherwise. Don't worry, Raymond. We'll we'll come back to you once we've sorted out the muting. OK, um, I'll, I'll now move on to Susan then, <laughs> if I may, Susan. Um, so um, 
I wonder what you felt about the, the risk assessment process for staff support supported uh, healthcare worker safety, how you can improve it in the future. I mean, we're, we've learned a lot about assessment uh, and risk assessment for staff. And I'm just wondering what your reflections have been in terms of where you'd like to think that we could take this debate. Yes, of course. Um, throughout the pandemic, the RCN and our members have been continually calling for, for action for the government to ensure that the safety of staff and people in their care is overriding in all decisions. And of course, as you say, risk assessment is crucial in this to determine what those decisions should be. Um, from the outset, the lived experience and the reported deaths of nursing staff were revealing this very stark picture that we've all seen. And we were seeing that BAME staff were at increased risk as you've said from infection and death but it felt the government and employers were slow to act on this. Our BAME members in particular were reporting to us very limited or no access to risk assessments at the beginning of the of the COVID pandemic. The main NHS risk assessment tool was developed in May when COVID-19 was already at its peak and risk assessments were then slow to be rolled out. We didn't see it uh, gaining momentum very quickly and confidential discussions around redeployment were not happening in all settings. Since March, we've had nearly 1500 calls to our member helpline regarding risk assessments. And in June, many of our members working in NHS settings were reporting that they still hadn't had a risk assessment completed. So there's there's work to do. And for nurses who were given risk assessments, the overall experience was not always positive. Many were saying that the tool was used too frequently to send staff home rather than finding solutions like sensibly transferring, redeploying staff. And we have heard, we are aware that some employers have used risk assessments to advise members to take ill health retirement or leave. Some of our members also reported hostility with peers around the risk assessment process, with some senior colleagues and peers questioning what they re referred to as special treatment. Um, staff are essential workers who, you know, we must protect their safety. They're not sacrificial heroes, you know the term heroes. It's wrong for safety measures to make staff targets of hostility. Some nursing staff have no confidence in this system and the management to conduct the risk assessments correctly. And we need, and um, previously we've spoken about training, we need to increase the understanding of different risk factors and the importance of risk assessments to cater for staff with differing needs. And going forwards, more must be done to develop the understanding and importance of safe staff in the inner management across NHS and the wider system. We need to encourage managers to have supportive and confidential conversations with all, particularly our BAME colleagues, about any underlying health conditions that may, Im you know, may have impact. And it's really important that the government and employers reflect on the lessons that we have learned from the slow rollout of risk assessment so that staff and patient safety is not further compromised. Thank you. I think you might be on mute. Classic, classic. Um, sticky mute, sticky mute button. Uh, it goes with being a grandfather, I think, probably. Um, <laughs> uh, so um, I, I'm just interested, David, just before we go try and get uh, Raymond back in, David, yeah. thought, thoughts about risk assessment process across other countries and nations? Is that is this is has this been um, part of the debate? Um, and, and is there is there learning we can make from that? Can Massive. And uh, just say that, uh, first of all, what a lovely series of presentations. The reason why I like them is that people are talking the reality of what's involved in trying to get teams to put safety at a higher priority when they've been used to the autonomy of working in their own professional groups and sometimes actually find this kind of structured team working to be quite difficult. The medics are particularly bad. If we look at nurses, their whole system of handovers and careful briefings is actually a very good one and can actually set the standard. And it's probably some of the medics who are uh, inclined perhaps not to do those more disciplined processes that, that maybe 
at least setting an example that's not so good. Getting this notion of collective discipline amongst staff involving patients, always bringing on board the orderlies, the porters and all the rest as well, seems to me to be absolutely key. And what I just heard really, honestly, was just a wonderful example of how you do it, what Susan just said. And uh, my takeaway is that we just need to be very open with people. This is not magic, it's tough. Making sure that teams work well is hard, especially when they're from different professional groups. Let's keep talking about it. We've got to make it a habit. It's not yet there. OK, thanks. Thanks, David. Thank you for that. Um, now, I, I also reflect on that. The, the, um, for one, one of my uh, uh, constant issues is, is hierarchy, I think, and, and the role that hierarchy has to play in, 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 in safety or actually in preventing um, safety. Initiatives. I would agree, Mike. We, we absolutely need one of these whistleblower protections. It should not be called whistleblower, but basically if somebody in a team thinks that there are practices that are just uh, adding to the risk of something bad happening, they've got to be able to speak without being worried that they're going to get marginalised, given bad hours, all those other things. Yeah. And um, I mean, you all know that better than I do. I look at this at the moment now, I'm seeing sort of a beginning bit old. Yeah. I tend to see it more second hand, but I think everything that you're doing that identifies ways of protecting people who speak out, really important. Yeah, no, no, it's a, it's a, it's a reflection from from our the, the the global patient safety collaborative that we're 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 lucky to be the academic partner for is actually, it's one of the key elements I think, and it and it's not just relation to to tribe, you know, to whether you're a, a medic or a nurse or a, a therapist, but it also it's there's a gender specific issue, there's a age issue, um, so it's um, it's it's widespread. Um, I'm just wondering is Ray, is Raymond back on yet? Have we managed to to unmute Raymond? Um, hi Raymond, can you, can you hear us and can you speak? Not yet. Okay, then don't worry. We're work we're working on it. We're working. On it. So David, I'll come back to you then, if I may. Um, I mean, uh, I found when these things go wrong, it's quite yeah. useful sometimes to connect my phone. I hope you can hear me. Can you? Yeah, Just yeah, we can hear you very loud. Well, I've, I've said some of the things I wanted to say. Uh, uh, but I'm obviously going to uh, augment them. First, a massive shout out to, to um, Jeremy Hunt and actually also to Liam Donaldson for the work that they did and others did to bring patient safety to the fore and to make certain, as was said earlier, that the World Health Organization got much more focused on this and that uh, now we've got the World Patient Safety Day uh, and like, like Jeremy Hunt, I've just been hearing what Dr Tedros has got to say and, and seeing some of the in incredibly good work that's coming through. All right, just a couple of words about COVID. Um, we, we probably have got ourselves into difficulty talking about it as a pandemic and treating it as uh, an emergency issue. The reality is the virus has come to join the ecosystem of pathogens uh, with which humanity must navigate. And that virus is not going away. There's no evidence that it's going away. There's no evidence like influenza that it naturally becomes a softer pathogen. Uh, it's just as rough and nasty as it was when it started, we think. Uh, and although there are some differences in mortality experience around the world, we think those can be explained more by local factors rather than any change in the virus. So part of the narrative that I'm really keen, Mike, to continue promoting is one of uh, getting on with life, which we've all got to do, requires us as a collective in, in the human race to learn to live with this virus as a constant threat, to stop it from welling up uh, and overwhelming us and at the same time to get on with our lives, to get on with our economic lives, our social lives, our educational lives, our political lives, because the longer we go on pretending that we've got a choice between dealing with the virus and getting on with the economy, the more dangerous we are making the future. Uh, and I, I have to keep saying that. Uh, I need to find the right idiom for saying it. I'd love it if others could advise me on how best to get the message across. Because politically, we're losing the battle. We are still now finding leaders 
presenting it in terms of a choice, presenting it in terms of uh, a bearable risk, presenting their national health services or their local health services as somehow expendable, presenting this as an inevitable burden on health personnel. Whereas we've got to turn the narrative round. This is something we can deal with. Not going to be easy, much tougher than coming to terms with HIV, which was tough enough. But we've got to, we've got to get that narrative right. You see, even if a wonderful one vaccine does appear next year, and even if it can be made available for everybody, we've seen, Mike, with measles, that it's really hard to uh, immunise everybody. There are lots of factors that get in the way. There are logistical factors, but there are also um, really, really big uh, human factors. And so don't let anybody say a vaccine solves the problem. Instead, we have to collectively work out how to do with the virus. We have to collectively agree to move forward with comprehensive measures. Mm -hmm. And we've got to be prepared for a very tough next six months to one year. Very, very tough. Uh, depending on which projections you like to use, uh, but most of us think that, that the, there will be a significant upward pressure in COVID infections in Europe, in North America, and indeed in many other parts of the world in the coming six months. And rather than pretend that it's not going to happen or we'd be surprised if it does happen, uh, we actually say this time let's get better prepared. And let's not at all contemplate major lockdowns as a means to control. They're not controlling measures. They just freeze the virus in place. But let's get the necessary public health essentials in place. Let's get human uh, populations understanding what needs to be done. Let's get health services and health workers properly prepared for what could be a, a tough period. And not get surprised, not feel that we're having to scramble to keep up. So. I've got words, you know, my, my first pair of words, two A's are am, anticipate ambitiously. Let's make absolutely certain that we get it right. Secondly, be briefed and be better. I think that a, a great deal of emphasis has to be on the things that were mentioned just now to do with engaging people in large teams, not allowing tribal differences to impede proper teamwork having discipline about sharing information with the, the proper handovers and briefings and routines and, and so on. Uh, absolutely making sure that there are respectful relationships so that there's no opportunity for people to be marginalised. And just saying sharing information is what we do rather than what we don't do. Again, when you go tribal, people hide information from each other. So de-tribalising care teams is key and having our patients uh, as much as possible part of the discussion if we can, uh, often difficult, but it makes a huge difference if they are enabled to be members of the team rather than treated as though they're somehow not part of the team, even though they're so important in it. Uh, lastly, I, I really thought that uh, listening to the comments, particularly on the video, uh, we need to see that there's something we've got to build into all this, and that is the notion of caring. If we are caring for each other, and obviously, of course, being conscious about our caring for our patients, which is how we work, then it will make these relationships between the different actors much, much easier and will make connection much, much easier as well. Uh, and so I want to keep the, the, the focus on connecting and caring them. And um, of course, in the end, it's about discipline, but discipline doesn't work without there being a sense of common purpose and a sense of trust. And so the, 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 the discipline in there uh, needs to be something that comes with the dedication to our professional uh, pathways. So I was in my sort of summary of what I was trying to convey in these words, Mike, the two A's were anticipate ambitiously. The two B's were be briefed to be better. The two C's are connect and care. And the two D's are dedicated and disciplined. Uh, whether those words are useful or not, I don't know, but I always walk around with lists of words in my head. It's the only way I remember where my car keys are. And uh, with that, I want to 
actually give a massive shout out to you, Mike, but to the whole team for the work that you're doing. This is a truly British gift to the world. It has had a, an enormous impact already, the Patient Safety Day and the Patient Safety at Approach. It will have a greater impact in the longer term. And now as we're dealing with this extraordinary threat of COVID, mm -hmm. uh, I think we can find ourselves making certain all the time that health places are safe places, because that is indeed what we are dedicated to do. Thanks very much. Thank, thank you, thank you, David, um, for a great, uh, a great few moments there. Um, 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 I won't. Well, I will take the liberty of adding excellence and exemplary then in, uh, to your uh, to your um, uh, your uh, your first five words of the alphabet. So thank you very much. Um, and I know we'll come back to some of those, but I I, I am absolutely convinced, certainly of this this constant uh, constant need uh, to to share and be transparent and, and reduce tribalism um, in, in all the work that we do. And I'm glad that you mentioned patients. I think I think. Um, we say no patient safety without healthcare worker safety, but the corollary is the same. Um, uh, healthcare worker safety without can't exist without patient safety. So we we need to to marry those two up and be absolutely respectful uh, of, of our patients and their and their families. Um, now, Raymond, uh, you've struggled uh, for a, for the last few few moments. So I, I I think I understand that we're back on online on now and unmuted. So. So um, if I could go back and remind you of the question that I, I wanted to ask, it was really a reflection and actually you probably had the chance to listen to the others as well. But uh, in terms of being on the front line, orthopedic surgeon, really sharp end, um, working with lots of different teams. And I'm just wondering what your, you found the challenges were uh, as a leader of a team, but also how did you bring out and support the nurses and the junior doctors and the others in the physiotherapists in particular in the in the teams and, and what sort of challenge did the challenges did they bring to you uh, about their actions on the front line thank you thank thank you mike and and apologies that there, there's always no one. apologies needed <laughs> don't worry, don't worry. Um, it, it's a really interesting and, and, and complex question and um, thank you thank you for asking it. I, I think the challenges have changed as, as we've moved through the phases of the pandemic and early on we were dealing with a huge amount of uncertainty and learning at a really rapid rate and we, and we were all learning, we were always saying that. Um, and we heard in the videos and in some of the comments earlier about the humanity of healthcare workers. We are human beings, so it's it's natural to be afraid and to have concerns and, and fear is a consequence of that uncertainty. And in that setting, information is really important and how we share that information with our teams, with our staff and with our patients and, and also their families. That So that flow of information was vital and we worked out quite quickly that the, 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 t the whole team had to have that information so it wasn't just patient facing staff who would be there and healthcare workers but also the porters and um, the catering staff the cleaners were so important to, it, to, to our effort and linking all of that together so the crg that julian referred to earlier on was a really good way of making agile decisions responding to their feedback and trying to set up those links and that information and we were also very conscious of the fact that the uncertainty fed into a, a sort of situation where there was a huge amount of speculation in the media and the news and that, that perpetuated the fear and the concerns that people had that they might be at an increased risk. So that was something we, we, we thought was really important we, and we tried to get a, a good handle on. And as key themes in, in that area, transparency, regular information and regular communication and just being really honest and saying when we didn't know something because we were waiting for further information, waiting for clarification or we just didn't know yet and we were ma making our best efforts and trying to um, give the best advice and support possible. So that openness, I think, became very obvious to our to our teams that um, we were all in this together. We had a really particular challenge and we've heard a bit in the videos about the particular risk to BAME staff members. And for us at Imperial, our, our figures are probably around something about 53 percent of our staff are, are identify as BAME. So they really are a, a huge part of the workforce and the team. And frankly, we 
couldn't have done it without them. Um, it, that we were very much helped by the sense of community that Julian and several others have, have alluded to. And it, it, we, we, I've said it before, we were really all in it together. So we made a number of specific um, interventions or uh, took measures to help and support our BAME staff. Uh, the fit testing, trying to make sure that we had appropriate PPE, as you've heard, um, considering different cultural aspects or concerns. And something that we learned was actually that what we thought might be the priorities or the key concerns of our staff members and patients would, were not necessarily the case. Sometimes there was a mismatch. And so it was really important to take that initial step, as Don said in the video, and listen to the concerns and take that feedback and take what people said seriously and not assume that we knew best. Coming coming into the current state and where, and where we are, I think the two key challenges that we have are fatigue and complacency. And we keep coming back to how the staff and healthcare workers are human beings. And it is really, there is an emotional drain to constantly wearing masks and communicating differently and having to be aware and conscious of how you interact with patients and other staff members and limiting those contacts. But it's really important. And we have to, in the same way that we've supported each other through the height of the pandemic, we have to learn how to support and encourage our colleagues to continue those good behaviours as we move into the next stage. And probably the next, the other challenge I think that we have for the future is giving our staff and our healthcare workers the skills and the training to continue what they've done so far, while at the same time trying to reintroduce I use the term normal, it won't be normal, but routine elective planned care for our patients, care that they need. And also to, uh, uh, training is something that we haven't really um, talked about, but healthcare organisations train and we have to continue to produce doctors and nurses um, for, for the future. So, so those will be challenges that we are yet to face, but I'm quite confident we can do it. We've talked about the community effort and support that we've had, and it, it really has been phenomenal. Um, we couldn't have done what we've done so far. Without it, but we certainly need it for the future. Great, thank you, thank you, Raymond. Um, some some wise words there, and um, I think lots of lots of um, uh, uh, linking to 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 everything that we've all we've all heard and 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 uh, have discovered. I, I'm particularly interested in the in the. The education and training element, I think, the ongoing needs of of, of all our staff, actually, from undergraduates through to to postgraduates, about how we can uh, make sure that uh, we we do that appropriately and re and reflect on on the last six months. And certainly, we have the opportunity um, soon with the new WHO patient safety uh, curriculum guide and and many other guides that the, the syllabus from from the UK from the NHS. Um, uh, and others around the world. So I think there's an opportunity there to make sure we harmonise some of the learning uh, that we've taken uh, on board now. I'd like to, to just bring Kelsey in uh, now, I think probably in terms of before we go around uh, and, and, and open up again and have a conversation. But uh, Kelsey, now you're leading uh, the Patient Safety Translation Research Centre. Um, you're doing it in conjunction nationally with, with the other centres. Uh, uh, in in Yorkshire and and uh, and Manchester and and uh, I just wonder what your your thoughts were there for in in how do we how do we harmonise the learning and how do we set a strategic set of research questions um, uh, uh, for the next phase? I mean we we know that uh, a lot of the 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 journals are full are are are, are stuffed. Uh, literally with with covid related um uh, commentaries activities and and we're just wondering how do we how do we sort that out and and how do we think about what are the real questions to ask and, and what learning should we start to think about thank you mike and thank you to the panel and to the excellent thoughts that we've heard so far i think uh, mike it's a great point to open up the question about research because i realized that uh, the Imperial PSTRC in conjunction with the other PSTRCs across the country are our hosts for today and it occurs to me sometimes that research centre still gets mistaken for a kind of academic centre that just produces papers and then moves on to the next um, kind of research question. The PSTRCs um, have been designed by the NIHR specifically to be much different than that. 
we're translational by definition, which means that we've had an evolution over the last kind of 15 years of really trying to understand the epidemiology of safety, but very much moving into the new interventions and applied healthcare research that can improve safety. So we really are partnering quite closely with our NHS and policy colleagues. Um, our team work very closely with Julian's team um, and the, in our trust, but also with trusts across the country to make sure that research is embedded. And I think that's the fundamental principle with actually driving applied research in the patient safety space. It's about embedding research principles and research and scientific ability in the NHS rather than kind of studying it outside and then trying to apply it. Um, I think to answer your question though, one the kind of components of that do include collating the academic and the scientific evidence base. One thing we've tried to do for healthcare worker safety in advance of today is really develop a policy brief which we'll be publishing in collaboration with the WHO around healthcare worker safety principles of what healthcare workers actually go through, what is the evidence around that and how can we improve it? Because as an academic centre, we have to understand the, the currency that is scientific evidence. And when we can put that together in a powerful way, that's where science can actually drive policy and change. Um, and then on the more kind of frontline uh, piece, I think that we have to be thinking first about the interventions for improvement. So how do we make the situation better? We're running a couple of national trials around healthcare worker burnout, both in clinicians and in nurses. And that's partnering with organisations across the country to really understand how can we actually, using behavioural insights, make the situation better. But I think we also need to look to the future. And like you said, develop that learning system mentality. And we all say we're moving into a new normal. How about kind of a better normal? So what are the ideas for making the situation better, not just improving where we are? Um, we're doing a bit of this in our work um, with partnering with a lot of our different patient partners and our staff partners um, to build more strong, resilient teams who are future focused. Um, and if I may, David, to kind of follow on with your theme, I think it that future focus piece, which I think you do capture in the anticipated bit, but because we're on Fs, um, I think it is about being future focused and using that health security model, which Professor Darcy spoke so eloquently about earlier, to anticipate what's coming next. So we don't use the old safety model of responding when error happens, but the kind of newer safety model of actually harnessing what goes well. And I can add the second F, which is what I'm very interested in around feedback. So all of those different pieces of work we're doing generate feedback from our staff and our frontline workers. And in order to be a truly kind of learning health system, we have to listen to that feedback. We're doing a few trials across the UK now about using our free text staff feedback, not just quantitative surveys, to really understand what they're telling us and developing kind of the learnings, both from COVID, but also from decades of feedback that we have from staff. Um, so I think that's where we're moving into in a research space and hopefully that can be a translational exercise, not just an academic one. Great, Thank, thanks Kelsey. I think um, a, a huge agenda there, I think, for, for us all. Um, uh, and, um, uh, and I think for me, the, 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 to go back is, is agility. I think we've got to be really agile in, in terms of um, getting, getting uh, questions out, but also then, as you say, translating the translating that, that data into real good information that we can use uh, on, on the front line. Uh, Susan, I just wondering if I could bring, ask it because the RCN is both both in terms of your your um, uh, your duties, also a key a key learning organization. And I, I'm just wondering um, uh, what you think of in terms of your role as a, as, as the sort of the educational resource for 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 nursing and allied and, and other groups. Yes, absolutely. And actually, first of all, if I could just come back to the C's on connection and care, I think I'm going to be using that a lot, David, those 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 letters. But um, I think 
profoundly we've got from a nursing perspective and our membership we've got a workforce who are absolutely exhausted and actually to go on through into winter this is the key concern you know this is what keeps me awake at night this is the key concern that we have to address in order to move forwards um, and go on you know there's a real concern about the retention of nursing teams the retention of staff who've been on the front line um, they're exhausted we did a recent quite large member survey and nine out of ten of of those respondents are really worried about the well-being of their colleagues you know concerned about other people but also over three quarters 76 percent reported an increase in their own stress levels and 37 percent which is really worrying are now considering leaving the profession both for concern for themselves but concern for their families their loved ones and you know it's really vital that we move to have quality counseling and psychological support um, as soon as possible where they can refer themselves to these services so there's no delays um, and, and that we're able to move the workforce forwards because without doing that we're not we're just not going to be able to move forwards with any of these different innovations this is the critical bit to do first okay yeah thank you Susan thank you right we're starting to get some questions through from uh well we have we've been collating the question through and, and if you don't mind me squinting as I as I read the questions um uh, we've got one. I think. I think for Julian. I think it's sort of. Um, it's. It's really. Uh, it's, it's geared around PPE. Um, um, and I think it's a question that has two elements to it. But the, the first one is is, is about um, the question directly says who's responsible to assure staff that they will always have PPE available when caring for affected patients. But I. But I guess the second piece is 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 also um, about. Um, uh, Assuring staff that, that the availability, uh, as well as uh, as well, and the the feedback, I guess, from staff that that where how do they do? How, you know, how have you addressed that in Imperial? Have you thought about the next phase in terms of that feedback loop? Because it's often the feedback loop that it sort of breaks down. I think under when we're under pressure. Sorry, Julian, you need to un. Yeah. Typical, uh, Mike. Thank you. Um, and um, I, I've got to start by sort of reflecting some of the things that Raymond said, because I think I think uh, people who haven't worn PPE for long periods will not recognise just how difficult that is. Um, it's uncomfortable. It's uh, a very, very challenging environment to be in um, and the communication issues which come from it. So any research around improving how people the types of PPE and, and making it easy to wear, I think would be very, very good as well. Um, we are absolutely focused on making sure that our supply lines are secure and that we have the correct PPE coming in, both at a, as a hospital level, but also at a regional level. And I know then at a national level as well. Um, the first wave, I think, were really challenges, and I hope that we have learned the lessons from that around the supply chain and how we can therefore assure our staff that we have uh, the correct PPE for them um, and the, the correct amounts of PP and we've done modelling and we believe that we are in the correct position around that. Um, the issue then is around making sure that staff use the people have the ability to use the PP correctly and that we've got the right environment for them in terms of donning and doffing um, and the right training and the right support for them uh, to use that as well. Obviously, there's always a bit of a shared responsibility because we need to make sure our staff have uh, the ability to access that and to use that information correctly. So at Imperial, we've taken a, a, a more of a proactive view of this and we've developed this role of PPE helpers. And these are people on the ground who are able to go around to specific areas, observe staff uh, donning and doffing their PPE and listening to their issues and challenges which are coming and therefore be able to help them immediately and then feed back to us at the CRG any changes that we need to make at a, at a wider level to support our staff as well. So I think it is to do with ongoing education, observational, I don't want to use the word audit because it's not audit, but support, observational support uh, to our staff and then making sure we have the correct supply lines and the correct amount of PPE coming in all the time. Thanks, Thanks Julia. Um, uh, David, um, reflections from the first six months and then 
projecting forward in terms of guidance on TPE, uh, new models of wearing, um, uh, what have we learned globally? Um, we often see um, in the early stages very different approaches in different countries, particularly as the European centres uh, really were sort of suffering. Um, uh, and then very different approaches in some of the other uh, lower and middle income countries. And I'm just wondering, is there a, a, a global sense of PPE um, preparedness? Because although we're preparing for a whole series of second spikes or whatever outbreaks, many of the rest of the world are actually currently still in their first really active phase. Thanks very much indeed. Uh, obviously, uh, colleagues in WHO are hugely invested in the effort to try to ensure that supplies of PPE, particularly for health workers in poor places, are are sustained. Mm. Uh, but uh, I think everybody is also conscious that making sure we don't get stock out is really, really hard, particularly because there's a tendency always to stockpile. And as soon as you get widespread stockpiling within a country. For example, there's been quite a lot of stockpiling in European countries and in the US. It does really create awful holes in the global system. So in summary, first of all, everybody knows that the global system needs attention, but it's proving to be really hard to ensure that that system is resilient in the face of sudden spurts of demand that could lead to uh, shortages. We've got that same problem, of course, everybody knows with reagents for PCR tests right now. It's a global issue and it's not going to be resolved immediately. There are some uh, hard, hard limits there. So dealing with this un 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 unfortunate problem of supply and demand is hugely important. It'd be really helpful if the leaders of the different countries who are members of the World Health Organization made a really strong point of actually mandating WHO to go even further than it already is doing in trying to sort out the market failures by linking with the manufacturers, linking with the governments and others that want supplies, and then trying to create the right uh, interface. Uh, WHO's had to set up an airline, for example, to try to move stocks into a number of poor countries simply because the travel into these countries has been messed up by the pandemic. Secondly, just and I've only got a set with two points, and we are looking more and more at the spread of uh, infection among health personnel. As we get these numbers of people who are <laughs> sick and dying, it's clear that they're not all clinical personnel. In fact, uh, we see that actually the stats for, for example, intensive care personnel are quite good on the whole. Uh, but um, the, the people who are in roles that you don't normally expect to get exposed seem to be the ones who are in trouble. So that is the people who are doing uh, kitchen services, the people who are doing portering, cleaners do seem to be picking up the virus. It's a it's a load issue and we're always worried and there'll be aerosolization in particular settings and so we need to be really really conscious that anybody who's working in a health environment is at risk and uh, go right across the board i come keep coming back to the point that susan made about the absolute need to make sure that all members of the team are involved um just last point mike if there are questions about what who is doing on ppe any specific issues like what about stock outs of N95 or FP3 masks or what is the relative value of these um, shields versus masks and all the other sort of questions that people have. Don't hesitate to pass messages on to me. I'm not the quickest respondent, but I do reply and use my imperial email, which is exactly the same as everybody else, david.nabarro at imperial.ac.uk and I'll do my best to get answers. I think there are some quite acute issues that people want to talk about. Great, thank you. Thank you, David. Um, and thank you for that. those comments We and uh, the offer. Uh, we've got, uh, I think, a really important question from Ola, um, who, uh, if I could pray see the question, uh, it's it's really uh, that the, the pandemic highlighted the need for greater support for working parents. And 
uh, who are healthcare workers themselves and who are relying on grandparents, on friends. Um, and as Susan said, everyone is tired um, and many are, are overtired. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, there, and the question is, what levels of support should be put in place or could we put in place? And, and, and I'm thinking for Susan for, to reflect, but also for Raymond. I, I, I wonder what Raymond, how, the, how his team has been working, knowing that each, you're all relying on, on people to look after others, other, others in the family often to look after your, your children uh, or, in, or in some cases your parents, because uh, often uh, we're caring for, for uh, our parents as well or our grandparents. What, any reflections, Raymond, on keeping the show going? No, uh, then I'll come to Susan. Yeah. Thank you. As you say, it's, it's a really important question and that the, 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 the absolute dependence that we, we have on our, our workforce and our healthcare workers um, makes their relationships and, and their priorities really important to us and, and our planning as to how we're going to run a service. And at the height of the pandemic, the concerns were probably a little bit different in that many healthcare workers who were living with um, family members, young children, perhaps older parents, were really quite concerned that they might take COVID back home from the workplace. And, and that was a real worry and fear for a lot of them. And there was a lot of community support with additional accommodation and hotel rooms and that sort of thing. But it's not normal living, so it is an additional stress for these um, the, these people, as, as you as you can imagine. So it's really very tricky. And and going forward, looking at, ahead to winter, um, where you know we, we all have family and childcare commitments, and and people will become unwell, and the, the need to isolate if you develop symptoms. These are all things that we are thinking about, and I think it's it's. As a, as a nation, as a global community, we have adapted to COVID by working differently and not necessarily in a healthcare setting. People are working from home, people are working more flexibly, um, people are thinking about whether they really need to make that journey to the office or the work setting. It is different for healthcare workers, of course, and it's very hard to have your, to, to perform your role um, if, remotely if you're a healthcare worker. But it does suggest that we will need to look at our employment practices and our and, and our, our and have a discussion with staff about what they need and how we can support them to work differently or more flexibly, um, so that they can balance their work and family life and still contribute to our or to the organisation as a whole. But that's a bigger conversation, and and something we haven't specifically said. I'm sorry to sort of slightly divert, but it's still related. And we've spoken about the vulnerability of the, the BAME community and the BAME um, healthcare workers. But something I think we should also comment on is the absolute professionalism that we've seen. We've been so struck that despite the fear and the uncertainty, people have still come into work and, just, and have still performed their role and have still taken on their normal duties and have worked really hard so that we've been able to look after our patients. And I think there's been a sense that although they feel vulnerable and uh, exposed and unsure of the, their, their level of exposure, the, the Bain community, we, we have a very significant proportion of our um, patient population who identifies Bain as well. And so it works in both ways. That, that exposure, that vulnerability relates to our staff, but also to our patients. And, and I just thought it was worth commenting on. Absolutely. Thank you, Raymond, for reminding so that. Absolutely. Susan, uh, cl closing remark on this question, because I have one more I'd like to get out as well. Thank you. Just echoing um, those comments about our committees and professionalism of all of our staff that are, uh, you know, even isolating themselves from small children for a period of time to actually be able to come to work. But actually, just on a practical note, just at the moment, um, we're having lots and lots of calls from members saying that they're unable to go to work because they are waiting for results of small children's testing because they've had to have a COVID test because of a temperature. There's difficulty accessing tests at the moment that we have seen. Um, a, they may need to drive many, many miles, or they're waiting a long time for those tests. So they're they're not they're not wishing to be away from the healthcare setting, but they're having to make, be at home to look after small children who can't go to school. So I think that is a practical issue that needs to be resolved as swiftly as possible to enable as many people to be at work as possible. Okay, thank you, and and. Yeah, I, I think that's a, a daily reflect or an hourly reflection at the moment, isn't it? Across many countries, our, our own in, in particular in the in the UK. Right, um, we've got time for for one more question before um, I, the plug is pulled on this session. But uh, and I'd like 
really Kelsey to reflect on it, but then maybe I think we've uh, I think it'd be an opportunity for for Julian to to be sort of trust specific about it. So the question is from Will, um, and it's how do we rapidly collate and synthesize individual learnings and insights uh, in order to maximize these across the whole system? We heard earlier the importance of, of systems thinking and systems learning from Dominique. We've heard the, the global interaction from, from David, uh, and we've heard the frontline elements of learning uh, and, and putting in place practical issues from, from Susan and from Raymond. I'm just wondering in terms of the research question, but also the practicalities of translating that into practice about a, a whole system uh, learning approach, uh, maybe at the trust level. So Kelsey, do you want to reflect on that? And then and then we'll hand back to Julian to close that on. Yes, please. Thank you. Um, and it's a really important question from Will. I think that this is where hopefully the research community can come into its own following COVID, because I think to get the rapid part right, we need to be collecting evidence always. So we need to be collecting continual feedback um, through the surveys that we already have in place. But I think we also need to be going out and talking to people. And I know that's something our trust and other trusts have done very well, is in the aftermath directly following the first wave, is just literally speaking to people on the ground who have the lived experience of, of what this was like, who you know possibly lost people during this crisis. It's important to capture that. Um, and I think then to be able to synthesize something out of it and distill the evidence um, into something more concrete to act on, that's where we can use both the expertise of researchers and academics who can work with that feedback, but also something that we've all gotten a lot more familiar with during the crisis is digital technology and how we use data better. I think we have a lot of data from staff that is not necessarily used and we have excellent um, not just machine learning and AI ways of managing this data, but strong kind of big data capabilities where we can generate themes that can be acted upon quickly at a policy or a local level. OK, great. Thank you. Thanks, Kelsey. Um, Julian, so reflecting then on across the whole system, because you've got the whole of Northwest London um, under your command, I think probably at some stage. <laughs> I would not say that. <laughs> Yeah, no, and we've done a lot of work for this. I mean, within the trust, we have a very active QI community and um, uh, uh, and a QI approach to everything that we do. And we've challenged them with the uh, learning and insights from uh, the first wave of COVID. And obviously, we're using those all the time at the moment to learn about how we can prepare ourselves for any potential future waves, but also the learning we can take into the wider uh, care of patients. So this, uh, there's learning here that is around specifically around COVID, but also about how we can ex ex um, expand that out to the wider care environment. And that then is also true across Northwest London and then across London as well. And I've been involved in a number of events so far about how we're trying to feed back and learn from our frontline staff um, and then from the systems points of view, because we mustn't forget that we're talking to hear a lot about hospitals but the majority of the care went on in the community. And that was with our general practitioners, our community uh, colleagues, our colleagues in mental health and our colleagues in care homes. And obviously they've taken a very large um, uh, impact from this and continue to do so at a national level. And therefore everything we can do to support them and learn what they need from us to help and how the system can come behind to help care homes and no longer have them as a sort of a, a separate part to the NHS or health uh, response, but bringing them into our whole health response, I think is going to be the most important learning that can come out from this as well. Great, and I absolutely applaud that that, that approach, Julian, that, that, that it's a whole system. Our patients deserve care across their whole system and the families that support our patients. So thank you for that. Um, we, uh, we need to close this session down, but before we do, um, I want to give each of the panelists just a quick opportunity just to say one thing that you think um, is going to be important uh, for you uh, over the next um, phase of this. So your thoughts about you and what we've learned, what you've learned about yourself and about how you think you will be working over the next six to nine months. Susan, we'll start off with you. 
I think for me, it is the psychological support and, uh, of, of nursing teams. As I mentioned before, I think that's a real priority. I think, as has just been mentioned, the community nursing um, for us is a real priority with more comorbids for long COVID and people with complexities. Also, I spoke to a, a community director of nursing yesterday who said her end of life care caseload is 100% up on last year and their caseloads are rising. So big, you know, 80% 80, 80 plus of care happens in the community. So that for us will be a big focus. Thank you. Thank you. Raymond, in no thank particular you. order. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I think actually the, the main thing for me is that at the height of the pandemic, we, we really did focus on looking after each other and being kinder to each other. And my reflection probably is that no one or very few people come to work to do a bad job. And going forward, looking beyond COVID, we really mustn't lose that. We, we are much stronger together. We, the collaboration um, theme that Julian talked about earlier is so important. And if we're just conscious that um, we're all on the same team, but then um, I, th I think we can we can definitely improve things. Thank you. Thanks, Raymond. David, yourself. Thanks very much indeed. One in 20 are reported to be affected by long COVID. Susan mentioned it, but I want to give it uh, extra emphasis. Long COVID is affecting uh, obviously people in the health system, but it's affecting indeed the whole uh, British population in the whole world. We have not, I think, fully worked through what this means because not everybody gets really bad long COVID. There'll be mild long COVID and that will make it super hard for people to work well when, when they come back. Um, the finding ways to get whole system working uh, and to diminish tribalism is really important, but we use tribalism as a short circuit. So I find myself uh, with some difficulty on that one. Uh, and then that just to thank everybody for this. It's been really, really helpful. Over. Thank you, David. Thank you. Uh, Kelsey. Thank you. And I think the from the research community, the priority for us is really stepping up to help develop an evidence base about what works best and not just respond to what's gone wrong. OK, thank you. Great. And Julian. No, Mike, thank you very, very much. I, I, I was, I was, being last, that a lot of my comments have already been mentioned, particularly by Raymond. But I think what I'm going to finish with is to use two new letters. We've had A, B, C, D, E, I think an F, and I'm going to add in R now, because I think this is rest and recuperation. And I think this is going to be going on for a long time, as David said. And I think we need to make sure that our workforce has the time to rest and recuperate, look after themselves, make sure they have a healthy lifestyle and the ability to exercise and look after themselves. Great. Thank you very much, Julian. Thank you. Can I thank uh, the whole panel? Uh, David's had to had to leave uh, now, but thank you very much, Susan, Kelsey, Raymond uh, and, and Julian and Dominique uh, pre-recorded. It's a great, been a great session. Uh, questions are still coming in, but I'm sure that we'll have opportunities to, to respond to those questionnaires, question at ease. Uh, at, at some stage. So thank you very much. I, I've learned a lot. Uh, always learn um, by listening to everybody else. So thank you very much and uh, uh, hope I can see you all in the flesh uh, sometime soon. Uh, so thank you very much and we'll now move on to our next session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mike. So our next session uh, is really to bring uh, our conference today to a close. Um, uh, I'm really uh, pleased and privileged to be able to introduce uh, Nadine Dorries, uh, Minister for Mental Health, Suicide Prevention and Patient Safety. Jeremy mentioned uh, her earlier. She was with us last year uh, when, on World Patient Safety Day when we met um, uh, across uh, bringing people together across uh, England from the three NIHR PSTRCs and she's kindly agreed to to come again today. Uh, to talk about her thoughts on World Patient Safety Day. Thank you very much, Nadine. Over to your recording. Thank you.
Good morning. I'm delighted to be here with you all on World Patient Safety Day. And this event comes at a more important time than ever. This year, health and care systems across the world have been tested like they never have before. And a spotlight has been shone both on the importance of patient safety and the huge challenges and risks that healthcare workers face all across the globe. So there is a lot to talk about and a lot to learn from one another today. Before I share my thoughts, I'd like to thank Lord Darcy, a passionate voice of patient safety, for hosting this event today. And I'd also like to pay tribute to Jeremy Hunt. World Patient Safety Day simply would not be a date in our calendars were it not for his commitment and global advocacy on this important issue. So why is World Patient Safety Day so important? Because patient safety is ultimately about protecting human life. There is nothing more distressing than knowing that the death or injury of a loved one or a friend could have been prevented. This is an issue that is close to all of our hearts. I know it has been discussed at the Global Ministerial Summit on Patient Safety, which I am proud that the UK has co-founded. And I know that there will be valuable discussions today as we bring together leaders and clinicians to discuss how we can make sustainable and long lasting improvements to patient safety. I know that we are in the midst of a global pandemic and that health systems all across the world are under pressures that would have seemed unimaginable a year ago. But there is a lot we can learn in the past few months. Patient safety is a path of continuous improvement. So let's use the shared experience to drive forward this important work because there will always be more that we can do and we must always keep striving to do better. This year's theme on protecting health workers is an important one. The safety of patients and our health workers are two sides of the same coin. If health staff are not safe and looked after, then patients <coughs> won't be either. In my role, I have seen firsthand the dedication and care demonstrated by so many of my colleagues in the NHS. And we have a moral duty to look after them. After all, they have chosen to dedicate their lives to looking after the most vulnerable. We must protect those who protect us. Healthcare workers around the world face so many challenges, whether it's risk to healthcare associated infections, violence from patients or psychological challenges. We must shield our health workers from these pressures, not only because it is the right thing to do, but because stressful work environments can make and can mean errors are more likely to occur and can cause patients harm. Our people are our greatest asset. And so we have invested in making sure that our colleagues have the best possible working environment. We have a particular responsibility towards our colleagues from Bain communities, which have been disproportionately impacted by this virus. One in five NHS staff come from a Bain background and we have been working hard to protect them. So the risk they face is properly assessed and so the most effective safeguards are in place. However, I know that this is not the only challenge that our Bain colleagues have faced. We must acknowledge that not everyone's experience in the NHS has been a happy one and that too many people have experienced prejudice and discrimination. So our recently published people plan highlights our commitment to looking after our colleagues, including the urgent need to address the experience of the ethnic minority staff. Right from the start of this pandemic, we were very clear that patient safety must be protected. And we took steps to boost our workforce where needed. For example, legislation that allowed retired healthcare professionals to return to practice, along with allowing our arms and bodies to keep regulating, investing and reporting on patient safety. Whilst at the same time, adopting a more streamlined and proportionate approach so that we could maximise resources for the front line. For example, the Care Quality Commission suspended routine inspection activity and put in place its emergency support framework across all sectors using data and feedback to identify risks and problems. 
This was not a reduction of our focus on patient safety, but a balanced refocusing to ensure that nothing gets in the way of the immediate and necessary response. Looking to the long term, we are taking a number of different measures to make sure we embed patient safety throughout the NHS. And to make sure that regulators are listening to those who raise concerns, whether it's patients, their families or staff, and that they show empathy and sensitivity when they respond. Following the tragedy of Mid Staffordshire and other concerning cases, we have overhauled the infrastructure underpinning safety and quality in the past decade and taken steps to help staff speak up when they see things going wrong, which is crucial if the right lessons are to be learned and errors are to be minimised. Our measures include establishing the Healthcare Safety Investigations Branch to examine the most serious patient safety incidents and promote system-wide learning. Medical examiners to provide much needed support for bereaved families and to improve patient safety. A duty of candour so that hospitals tell patients if their safety has been compromised and apologise. Protections for whistleblowers and freedom to speak up. Guardians across all trust supported by a National Guardian and the Getting It Right First Time programme to reduce some wanted variations in clinical practice and help spread best practice to improve patient care and outcomes. Today, I'm pleased to make an announcement which will help to make our hospitals even more safe and secure. We know that electronic prescribing reduces errors for medicines by around 30%. And so I am pleased to announce today that NHS England and NHS Improvement has awarded an extra £8.7 million to trust to implement electronic prescribing in hospitals. However, we cannot stop here. For as far as there are cases of unsafe care, there will always be more to do. And so we will keep striving to do better so that the lasting legacy of any tragic event is an even safer health service for patients and staff. Patient safety is an important issue and we cannot solve it alone. So we want to keep working with other member states to reduce harm to patients worldwide. We will keep playing an active part in the Global Ministerial Summits on Patient Safety to support understanding of our work while learning from initiatives elsewhere in the world. We must all remain joined up, making best use of systems that have allowed today's seminar to happen. So we can develop a culture of patient safety where the patient is a partner, where a blame-free environment is encouraged and where healthcare workers are trained to reduce both patient harm and the risk of harm, and where the latest research and technologies are used to keep patients safe. These are all vital components of the 10-year NHS patient safety strategy published last year by your next speaker and our National Director of Patient Safety, Dr. Aidan Fowler. I hope that you enjoyed today's event. It is so important to encourage open-minded debates with frontline colleagues about what we need to do to safeguard health workers and patients. It is only through these honest conversations that we can make progress. And I'm looking forward to hearing more about what you've all discussed today. Now I'd like to hand over to Aidan, who will say more about how we are putting patient safety at the forefront of the NHS. Thank you all. Good morning on this, the second ever World Patient Safety Day. And thank you to Lord Darcy and others for inviting me to speak uh, on the subject of patient safety in England. There's a large amount going on and a huge amount to get through in a very short time. So if it feels rushed, that's for a reason. I want to share with you as much as I can in the time available. So here are some subjects that we'll cover, which includes uh, because this year's World Patient Safety Day is about staff safety as well, something on staff, as well as a little bit on inequalities, which is so important in the current uh, climate. 
the first question I wanted to cover is this uh, eternal question on patient safety of, are we any safer? Is it safer today than it was yesterday? Will it be safer tomorrow? And it is difficult to do this. We know there have been large harm studies such as the Hogan study. Um, these are huge pieces of work and we can't do this on an annual basis to look at levels of harm across the system and we can't rely on reporting. So it is helpful to have CQC data which tells us several things. One, if you look from uh, data from 18 to 19, there is an improvement overall in the level of trust um, being good for safe. Uh, and importantly, we now have the first trusts who are outstanding for safety, which has never had happened before, those being Papworth and Western Sussex. Uh, if you look over a five year period, the um, changes, the improvements are more stark, which is encouraging. In a specific area of maternity, we have seen a lot of very concerning news, um, largely relating to a few units. I would argue this is the tail where there has been a shift of the distribution curve in the right direction in general, but we have a few units where we still know there are problems. I think we are getting quicker at identifying them and I think we are getting better at supporting them. If you look at the overall maternity data, which you'll see here, uh, there isn't yet progress on brain injury rates, uh, but these are old data. There is always a lag for these data. So we are looking for an update on this to see progress. The other area that's uh, worth noting that doesn't appear to be on trend is neonatal deaths, but this, if you break it down, is specifically about very preterm babies, which are now being resuscitated, who would not have been between 22 and 23 weeks, and they have a very high mortality and would previously have been recorded as a miscarriage. In general, the post 24 week neonatal death rate is going down. So we have had our part in this in the patient safety team and there have been large um, maternity improvement programs with a variety of drivers which have seen improvement over time. So inequality in patient safety is a very important issue, particularly um, brought into focus by um, events like Black Lives Matter and also COVID. And we know that um, in COVID there is inequality, in maternal mortality we have inequality, and certainly in mental health we see inequality, for example, in restraint. And we are looking specifically at how we can go further and faster on balancing these. On the implementation of the patient safety strategy, this was launched in July, just over a year ago, therefore. Uh, and although we have uh, had COVID in the intervening period, we have made considerable progress. So we now have taken in-house the um, patient safety measurement unit, which gives us a better ability to build a stronger unit with much more outcome data coming in the future. We are replacing NRLS and STICE. We've known about this for some time, but we have now passed government GDS and are allowed to go into public beta on that, which is really important progress. We are changing the, from the serious incident framework for investigations to a new patient safety incident response framework, which will release um, time and also be less adversarial. So I think a number of improvements in that. Medical examiner system, which uh, was delayed by COVID, is now um, going at a much faster pace. And by September, we expect to have medical examiners in all but a couple of acutes and then start rolling out into the community. And you see other things we've done, including new alerts, which we think are much clearer and easier to act on and much easier for CQC to follow up on. We want to harvest knowledge from those who are doing well. We don't just want to focus on where things have gone wrong. We want to focus on where things have gone right, the safety to approach so-called. And we have started a piece of work which has been delayed by COVID on um, harvesting knowledge from the outstanding trusts and trying to understand uh, what uh, their success is all about and see how we can transpose that to other settings. On the involvement side, uh, we have a much greater patient involvement in patient safety. We deliberately have um, made patient safety partners. Um, there's a consultation on that at the moment and these will be on all um, the governance quality boards across organizations over time, 
probably two in each. We are already uh, interviewing and uh, recruiting um, people to serve in these roles with our own committees, which has been incredibly helpful and effective. We're going to see patient safety specialists across all organisations by November this year, and we now have um, a patient safety syllabus, which we've been working on with HEE and the Academy of Medical Royal Colleges, uh, which is the first ever patient safety syllabus, which we will start training people on, which will include those patient safety specialists. In the improvement domain, lots going on again. We tailored this specifically around COVID, but now are returning to our original plans, and there is a wide range of programs that you will see highlighted here. We aimed to refresh the patient safety strategy annually. Um, in view of COVID and the learning we will also get from that, we have delayed that to uh, November this year, but we have just recently um, published on our uh, progress uh, report to show where we've got to on all the different elements of the strategy. So, As far as our response to COVID is concerned, you will see here um, reporting from the NRLS, which shows that um, incidents mentioning COVID, clearly we'd never had any, spiked shortly after, allowing for delays for reporting, uh, the peak of COVID. And we have been searching through those data and responding as quickly as possible to new issues that we've seen. Here you will see uh, a couple of uh, alerts. And the first one was about oxygen, um, the, the large oxygen storage facilities and the risk of overwhelming them. Uh, we were, uh, this, this issue was highlighted to us and we had a report out to estates within 24 hours uh, advising people of this risk. And you'll see on the right our new style patient safety alerts. And this was one that was COVID relevant that we issued during um, a recent surge. We have offered support to the Nightingales on safety checking how they are structured. We've worked with HCIB on rapid uh, response reporting, particularly uh, one in Watford where they had an issue with oxygen storage. And we've worked to look at how mask fitting can be improved and ventilator design and use can be improved. And in addition, as a Deputy Chief Medical Officer, I've offered a, a large amount of support in testing to increase our testing capacity from about 2,000 a day to its current 200,000 a day in order that we can understand what's going on better and manage better um, the COVID pandemic. We've been doing a number of things to support staff, including uh, in testing. Um, this is relevant to understanding how many um, staff are, were carrying um, COVID at any one time. Uh, and we noted that uh, having carried out over 20,000 PCR tests, the prevalence rate in staff across the NHS was higher than community. Much of this was modelled to be um, staff to staff transmission of the difficulties of social distancing at work. This helped us in the um, fight against nosocomial spread and those rates have come down significantly. We've looked at um, staff antibody positivity rates by doing over a million tests in staff and this has shown that on average 16% of staff who've had antibody tests have been positive and this has varied by uh, region um, and in keeping with the regional prevalence of the disease. The medical examiners uh, I talked about rolling out, they have a role now in scrutinising the death of um, healthcare and social care workers and understanding where that might have been as a result of um, exposure at work and making sure that where relevant those cases are reported either to HSE or to the coroner or both. EPE uh, has been uh, of critical importance. You will see the spike in reporting compared with previous years. We have worked on the design of this, particularly around the equalities agenda, noting that these masks are not well fitting for some ethnic groups and we've looked at the design of those. So for the future, we will cement our strategy initiatives. Um, we will be annually refreshing our approach and working on that. We are responding to um, Baroness uh, Julia Cumberledge's report, First Do No Harm, and the implications of that. And particularly the Patient Safety Committee is important in that in bringing together for the first time all the arms length bodies on a group 
uh, that looks at patient safety issues across the piece and we've met a number of times already. It is in uh, very much uh, in development, uh, but it is up and running for the first time. Uh, we're looking at how uh, reviews and inquiries are handled in a more consistent way and how we would have a, a wider remit across patient safety. And again, I think first do no harm pushes us towards that. We are also um, working hard on our regional connectivity and working really well with the new regions, as well as growing our existing and brilliant patient safety collaboratives. Just before I summarise, this is an image I felt uh, represented our thinking. Uh, this is the Millennium Tower in San Francisco. It's built on the sand of San Francisco Bay. Uh, the foundations went down 20 metres. The bedrock is 70 metres down and it's now sinking and tilting and has to be underpinned. Uh, there are clearly already existing foundations in patient safety, but we want to build stronger foundations, changing the entire system and improving it. Uh, and not just pursuing the shiny thing you see above. Uh, so I would hope you will recognise that there's a lot of underpinning work going on in patient safety currently. So in summary, um, two years ago, I showed you the image below. This is uh, recognisable as from uh, Monty Python's The Life of Brian. It's a bit where they say, well, what have the Romans ever done for us? And we've often had that question. So what is patient safety doing? Well. Here's, here's a brief summary. The first ever patient safety strategy uh, is being implemented as we speak. A variety of patient safety collaborative programs, and we've now had over five years of these, are starting to show impact. We have the first ever organisations outstanding for safety, a new patient safety measurement unit, PSIMS going into public beta, a new framework for investigation, the first ever patient safety syllabus, we have patient safety specialists coming online in all organisations and patient safety partners to give greater voice to patients, again, as recommended in um, Baroness Julia Cumberland's report. We have new style approved patient safety alerts, the rollout now of the medical examiner model going widely and the first ever cross arm safety body patient safety committee. So I would argue there is an awful lot going on. Thank you for your attention today. Great. Thank you very much, Aidan. Uh, can we take the slide? Uh, so it's me live now, isn't it? So thank you very much, Aidan. Um, and uh, I'd like to thank you for your for your contribution this morning. And certainly, as you say, there's a there's a lot has been going on, a lot to to go on. And it's great to see that uh, healthcare worker safety now is absolutely aligned with patient safety. Um, and as Jeremy said right at the outset, they're two sides of the same coin. So we need to work equally hard on both sides of that coin. Uh, I'd like to bring our conference today to a close, but without doing so, I'd like first of all, I'd like to thank those behind the cameras, behind the laptops. So I'd like to thank Owen. Uh, I'd like to thank Nikki, Alex, Jessica and Kelsey for bringing this together and making it work so seamlessly. Um, uh, this is all done in-house uh, and uh, I think without uh, without uh, any problems. So thank you very much for huge effort uh, on your behalf and, and anyone else uh, I, that I failed to mention, I apologise. I'd also like to thank all our speakers, our keynotes, uh, Ara, Jeremy in particular with Nadine and Aidan uh, and our panellists um, who I think gave up their time uh, brilliantly uh, and I'd like to thank first of all and most of all the video uh, group uh, who put that video together from in, across Imperial but also those of you who have listened and those of you who contributed asking questions thank you very much keep asking questions uh, and someone will try to keep answering them uh, it may not be us but it'll be someone else so keep asking the questions that's the most important thing I think so we actually do develop a constant learning system Thank you very much for your time and your attention. It's been a privilege to be with you uh, and I look forward to seeing you in, in the future and possibly having a hug as well. Thank you very much and have a great day. Bye now. <laughs>